Good afternoon and welcome back to part two of today's cardiorespiratory conference uh, held at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. Uh, I'll be chairing today, uh, co-chairing with our lead sports cardiologist, Professor uh, Guido Pielez, uh, and we have a, an action-packed afternoon for you this afternoon. We have an action-packed afternoon for you. We could have, as I said this morning, we could have made this into a two-day two -day conference, but we've picked five truly world-class international speakers uh, on pertinent questions that the SEM clinician uh, is currently facing, whether that is cardiac involvement due to COVID, whether it's about restricting somebody with early cardiomyopathy or targeting the veteran athlete as they return to exercise from this post-lockdown period. So without further ado, I pass over to my fellow co-presenter, Guido, who will introduce our first speaker. Oh, I should say, uh, if you do have any questions, very much like the first uh, session this morning, uh, please put them in the in the Q&A uh, and Guido and myself will cherry pick the best ones and we'll ask them to our presenters and we'll have a good 10 minute Q&A after every talk this afternoon. Guido, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Matt. Thanks to ICH for enabling us to putting this cardiac program together and thanks to you for staying on after a very interesting respiratory session this morning. Um, yes, at Matt, as Matt says, we've got um, a fantastic talks with um, even more fantastic speakers on this afternoon. And if you look at the talks, then you will also realize that yes, sports cardiology has come a long way. Our talks firstly um, focus on specific topics and also include populations of athletes that 10 years ago, we would not have talked about. So this really shows the, the, the success of the sports cardiology work of um, the whole community and uh, we do this chronologically this afternoon and we will start with looking in the to the adolescent athletes as you all know the adolescent athlete population is increasing professionalization is increasing and uh, it is or it was very difficult to find experts 10 years ago to to discuss this topic with uh, a knowledge and with an expertise uh, that um, is probably and not better um, um, to be seen than in Craig Williams. Professor Craig Williams is the director of the um, Children's Exercise Research Center in Exeter, which specifically looks into activities and exercise in healthy children, but also in children with congenital heart disease, respiratory problems. Craig has worked within the NHS. Craig has worked with um, sporting organizations such as um, lawn tennis, British cycling, and also the Premier League, and is a um, much asked advisor for many international bodies. And he will talk on a specific topic, which becomes more and more important. Are we actually pushing our little ones too hard or is it the right way to make them into very good professional athletes? So Craig, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Stage is yours. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Craig Williams and I'm the Director of the Children's Health and Exercise Research Centre based at the University of Exeter. I'm a paediatric exercise physiologist by background and for probably just under the last 30 years I've been investigating the physiological responses to exercise for children and adolescents. And this would be across a range of different population groups including uh, clinical patients, talented youngsters, and normal healthy school age children. Now what I'm going to try and talk through today is looking at this, uh, are we pushing adolescent athletes too hard too early? What I'm going to try and do throughout this session is introduce some of the physical and physiological factors underpinning youth sports performance. It's probably fair to say that the longitudinal data sets for training of our youngsters are sparse. So to be able to definitively answer this question is gonna be very, very hard. But I hope to outline a number of emerging constructs and concepts, which at least flag some concerns to us that perhaps we need to manage the health and well-being of our athletes. And so I will discuss some of the potential risks to that management. And then towards the end, 
I'll propose some future recommendations for research and practice and how we can help our young athletes. So do we have a problem? Well, we have a number of uh, scenarios such as on the right hand side here, where we have a young Chinese girl being reported as completing a run of over three and a half thousand kilometers. And this was over a consecutive period of time. And we shouldn't be surprised by some of these feats. Our young athletes can accomplish incredible things. But of course, besides the uh, lack of surprise uh, at undergoing these things, perhaps we should really be asking ourselves, is this really a good idea? The other issue, if we take the example of rugby, so we know our England World Cup winning squad of 2003 brought great celebrations around the country for winning that trophy. And since then, there has been an accent on size and power in rugby, such that there is an average increase in the weight of Premiership and English players. And so what we see now in the under 18 squad is that the average age of these youngsters is heavier than the World Cup winning squad. So this is one of the issues in terms of emergence of different concepts and constructs in sports. And of course, with rugby, we have concerns about injuries and concussion. And this is just one of the ways in which this could potentially be raised as a red flag. Of course, there are other issues, the increasing professionalization of sports academies, not just in uh, football and rugby, but across the board. We know that the financial incentives and rewards are greater now for our youngsters if they become a senior adult professional player. And therefore, there is a great accent on trying to get youngsters in these particular academies to try and uh, become professional adult players and earn their careers from it. Now, throughout this presentation, uh, it's difficult to define uh, an athlete, a youth athlete, but I'm referring here to one that's systematically training, probably more than uh, twice a week, involved in competition. If it's a team sport, that might be on a weekly basis. If it's individual sports, it might be preparing for, for events. And they are also starting the adolescent growth spurt, which is a key distinction between adult trained athletes. So one of the key uh, factors is growth, maturation and development. Now note these three words are not one and the same, but they are often used interchangeably and incorrectly. And really, we know that growth is going to take a very well defined and recorded uh, path for our youngsters. Maturation, we know we can assess in a variety of different ways. And development perhaps refers to a little bit more globally and encompassing things like uh, intelligence and cognition, etc. And what's interesting in all of these pictures that you see is that these youngsters in each of their respective uh, photographs are all of the same age, yet we can see a great variance in relation to the growth and the maturation and the development of them. And of course, the issue is just because one young athlete is in advance of their particular maturation. In other words, they might be an early maturer. This does not always necessarily predict success. So it's very easy to think just picking the oldest and biggest and strongest players in any chronological age group, because this is how most sports are now organized, uh, is going to be the predictor for success. This is not clearly the case. And in fact, what we see is a bias in most sports for males is that early maturers are often selected ahead of later maturers. In girls, the differences are not so great and perhaps there is a bit more variance in terms of the predominance of early maturers in some sports, but not in others. Take, for example, gymnastics, which often favours later maturers who are lighter and smaller in order to complete the technical um, capabilities of their particular sport. So it is something that we need to really control for and assess and consider whenever we interpret any training data. And sadly, there isn't enough uh, 
data in this particular area. But people like uh, Bob Molina and more recently Sean Cummins from the University of Bath have been doing a lot of excellent work trying to look at the interrelationships between growth, maturation and development and how these might enable or predict success or indeed failure uh, throughout youth sports. Now I mentioned maturation can be determined uh, skeletally by the use of x-rays. I'm not going to say that skeletal maturation is the gold standard for assessing maturation because there are many other uh, maturations uh, that could be assessed such as dental maturation, somatic or sexual maturation and these depending on the nature of the research and the objective for the monitoring of the young, young athlete might actually be better placed for that type of assessment. But here you can see on the radiograph on the left hand side are uh, these both of these boys are 14 years of age but the boy on the left has a skeletal age of 12 and is therefore immature relative to his chronological age but the boy on the right hand side has a skeletal age of 16 years of age so he's two years in advance of his chronological age for a skeletal age and obviously the advancement for this particular uh, more mature boy in terms of ossification of the bones and the joints uh, will possibly help when the volumes of training are often increased as maturity is uh, complete and nears the adult state. And this is indeed what a lot of um, coaches and sports science support teams look for, is the maturation uh, close to the adult state so that the frequency and the intensity of the training can begin to be ramped up. Now this is partly as a result of Catch's trigger hypothesis and Catch in the early 1980s suggested that prepubertally you were going to get very small training adaptations if you train the prepubertal youngsters and they suggested this was partly a lack of hormonal control but if the youngster was post-pubertal, in other words, had nearly attained adult maturity status, this was a trigger point in which greater exercise in training inducers could be um, shown and therefore is a rationale for why the training loads can get ramped up. And typically this might be around those years of 12, 13, 14, 15. And you can see the graph on the right hand side looking at performance on the y axis and the pre pubertal and post pubertal stages and this trigger point. Now, sadly, this is actually a myth. The majority of data now collected over the last 30 years, as summarized by Armstrong and Van Mecklen in 2017, actually refute this notion of a maturational threshold and actually suggest that children and adolescents are trainable irrespective of any maturational status. And if you look at the graph on the right hand side with some excellent work from a former PhD student of Exeter, uh, Mel McNary, looking at swimmers, she was able to train these swimmers in the black bars, whether or not they were a prepubertal, a pubertal group and a postpubertal group. And looking at the change in the VO2 max or the aerobic fitness, there were changes irrespective of the maturity status. And data like this, which has been better controlled, uh, monitored and assessed, actually shows that there isn't a golden period for training. So children can be trained just as uh, easily as adolescents. The question is, should we? And what's the purpose of that particular training? It should still be acknowledged, of course, that there's a lack of perspective longitudinal data, maturity status and monitoring. Now, early specialisation is a problem. If we're looking at trying to get youngsters uh, training, then this notion again of this 10,000 hours uh, by Ericsson, again, that's been disputed. As little as 4,000 hours could be enough for success. We should also think about the chances of success. And here you see some statistics ranging from anything from 1% or less for success when you're a junior athlete to actually then make it into the adult circles. 
what tends to be shown, particularly by work by Cote and Defori, is that later specialization into a single sport is much better because you get less incidence of overtraining or burnout compared to early specialization children. And what we see is that elite athletes, adult elite athletes, didn't really tend to specialize until 15 years plus Mosey from uh, Germany has shown some really nice work looking at a broader sports sampling uh, experiences brings better both physiological and psychosocial characteristics uh, rather than just investing in one single sport. And we've shown this in some of our work at Exeter looking at the overtraining uh, continuum. So this is a continuum which is a process it's also a state and uh, can range anywhere from recovered to functional overreaching to burnout at the end here. And what we're particularly interested in is this area, non-functional overreaching, which is a decrement in performance or stagnation, which lasts for longer than two weeks and up to several months. And the prevalence of overtraining syndrome in young athletes uh, arises anywhere from about uh, 10 to 40 percent of the sample. You can see a range of different sports from distance runners, uh, swimmers, athletes, uh, soccer here. Most are in the range of 14 to 18 years. And some key studies by Raglan Kenta and Gustafsson have really uh, been able to give us some prevalence rates which are not dissimilar to the adult literature. In some of the work that we've done in prevalence and overtraining, um, which has been replicated in football recently, but I show you this data from uh, a paper published in Medicine and Science, Sport and Exercise, because it's UK data and it's multi-sport, really shows that the incidence of non-functional over overtraining does go up as the youngsters a move from representation from county to national to international. And of course, this exemplifies some of the pressures that these youngsters are exhibiting. And here I show some of the physical symptoms in, in which these youngsters, which were reported to be non-functionally or overtrained compared to those that were not overtrained, so all these are significantly different. These youngsters were often reporting the loss of appetite during periods of high training. They often got injured. They were frequently tired after competition. They would go through weeks where they can't uh, cope with the load. They'd get upper respiratory tract infections, muscle feeling, heavy stiffness and sleep problems. And these are just some of the physical and uh, other psychosocial are uh, uh, just important, but for time I'm not showing those. Now, in a cardiology session, it would be remiss of me not to mention the uh, athlete's heart. And here we can see in the black, one of the known adaptations, particularly to aerobic or endurance training is hypertrophy of the heart. But of course, if this hypertrophy goes too much and becomes abnormal, then there is the potential in this gray area where it could potentially interfere with the structural, functional and electrical activity of the heart. And then underlying that, of course, might be the diagnosis of anything related to a cardiomyopathy or some related uh, arrhythmia. And there's some very nice work being done by a number of groups uh, based in uh, Seattle, uh, John Moore's uh, UCL, Qatar, as well as our own group trying to understand the physiological or pathological adaptations that are occurring in our minds. So this uh, summary from uh, McLean, uh, published in 2017, nicely summarizes some of the basic characteristics that we're beginning to see in the young athlete's heart. So we are seeing in these young athletes uh, changes in T-wave inversion when compared to age match controls. We see some differences in uh, greater than 14 years compared to younger. We see some ethnic differences uh, in comparison to black athletes compared to uh, white or Asian uh, ethnic groups. And then even accounting for confounders such as age, um, we see left ventricular structural parameters which are still larger amongst the paediatric 
athletes when compared to athletes. Now coming to the conclusion now, we know that um, we think we should look for better education for all in terms of paediatric exercise sports medicine. We really do need to align uh, tracking research to monitor the characteristics and pin this to future success. Maturity is important so that we're able to interpret it alongside that of age. And that's generally how most sports are uh, classified. But we also need to develop a range of multidisciplinary tools that can monitor our health uh, and well-being over time. So with that, in terms of conclusion, it is easy to train young athletes like professional adult athletes, but that's not the point. The increase in interest in sports medicine and sports science certainly makes that uh, possible, but we really need to think about why we're doing some of the practices that we are doing. We really need to think about nurturing youth talent rather than focusing on the speed of the biological clock and selecting our most biologically mature uh, young athletes. And we really need to have better surveillance so that we can assess early and late specialization, the intensive training practices and recovery, so that it's a benefit to the young athlete, not the sport. So finally, I'd just like to thank all my group, particularly Guido Pielis and Graham Stewart on the left hand side, my collaborators from Bristol and recent PhD students, Dan Dorabantu and Curtis Wadey, who are investigating cardiac adaptations in the young athlete. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Craig, for this excellent summary. And which uh, leaves me scratching my head a little bit, and it will do the same for all other cardiologists. You talked about biological versus chronological age. And, and you know, as cardiologists, we like our normative values. So um, would you have any suggestion how we should go about it, particularly when it comes, as you mentioned, to ECG changes. It might be physiological and at some stage at a certain value become pathological. And so far, we've also looked at chronological age to, to, to judge what is disease and what is still health. But you saying, of course, there's a biological um, factor. Should we use biological age? Um, it's certainly something that's being looked at by many groups to try and in the very first instance, mark where the young athlete is in their biological cycle. Because the key thing is every uh, youth athlete is different. The timing and the tempo of their biological sequence is not gonna be one and the same to a chronologically age matched um, peer of theirs. So if the particular sports organization or academy doesn't really know where they are in that particular cycle, then they really can't decipher what is the effects of the actual training load. And, and that's the key point here. If you can't tease apart what is the effect of growth and maturation and what's the effect of the training stimulus, then it's very, very difficult to understand from the adaptations point of view of what is causing what and um, there have been good efforts made in the last few years looking at somatic maturation so this is using um, height particularly in a variety of algorithms that are now being produced uh, so the good thing about these are that they're practical they're quite feasible to implement but they still need a lot more data around them to give us much more precision so usually the error around them is at least plus or minus one year in the prediction of where that particular child is on their adolescent growth curve. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Obviously, the skeletal maturation is something that's sometimes done. Um, but again, it's not so easy to implement, uh, given the fact that there is a small dose of an x-ray being provided. So it is still work in progress, but I think it's probably something that we do need to, to keep developing as we move forward. Thank you very much. Um, I'm getting some questions in, interesting questions from the audience and exactly um, um, in this area. So um, should we really use a maturity offset over chronological age and particularly 
what should we do and how should we assess um, changes due to maturation, maybe going through a trough on one hand and on the other hand being aware that these trough changes might actually be overreaching, overtraining, pathology. So is there any monitoring pathways in these young athletes to address this and monitor this? Yeah, so many academies now and organizations are looking at the maturity offsets and that gives you at least a bit of an indication whether or not they're pre-peak height velocity, on the upslope of the peak height velocity, so they're maybe approaching at peak height velocity or post-peak height velocity. So they give you some indications and probably will allow you to make some decisions about whether or not you should restrict some uh, increase in volumes of training, particularly maybe intensity, uh, when that young uh, athlete is at the, the peak of their peak height velocity, this is a time when we know that the bone ossification is certainly outstripping a lot of the muscle mass changes, because we know muscle mass changes are usually six to 12 months post peak height velocity. And we do know that there can be a lot of um, bone related type problems in and around that, that area. So those type of markers do help us because chronological age will, will not give you that type of information. You, you can't just deal with all 13 year olds the, the same way, because as I showed with the skeletal x-ray, one youngster could actually be two years in advance of their chronological age. Um, so this, the idea of those sort of maturational assessments and markers I think will help think about the training loads and the volumes and the timing, the tempo of these things. Okay, thanks very much. I think we've got time for one more question. And uh, it's being asked, you've, you've, you've shown that specification, early specification uh, um, can, um, can possibly lead even to injuries that is common sense or overreaching over training. But what is the best, is there any data what is the best for talent, optimal talent development specification versus more general training before going into one particular sport or even into one particular position? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a multi-dollar question because there is no one system that has experimentally been shown to be superior to another. What each of these construct arguments are showing in terms of early specialization and late specialization are just a different variety of factors that the youth athlete will experience. If there are an early specialization sports, for example, gymnastics, then that's going to come with its raft of, of different problems compared to somebody who is maybe a multi-sport athlete and then doesn't specialize until a single sport until maybe 15, 16 years of age. Um, at the moment, there is a, a big debate in the paediatric literature going on about early versus late specialization. Um, there is a, a, a sort of big raft of evidence which is perhaps favoring the late specialization because it uh, doesn't bring with it some of the problems that the early specialization uh, athletes face. But we can't conclusively say that that is the model in which you will then get your senior athletes. What we can possibly say is that being a successful junior athlete is not a predictor for senior success as an adult. In fact, most of the data suggests that the junior champions often don't make it as senior athletes. And it's maybe more the youth athletes that are ranked six, seven, eight, ninth, tenth that come through late. And again, that could be partly partly maturation, partly relative age effect, etc. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, this was an excellent introduction and, and it's probably clear to everyone that despite having an expert as you are here to discuss it with us, there are still more questions than answers. And I think over the next decade, hopefully we will also when it comes to sports cardiology um, move forward and get a little bit more specific um, data and also advice on the pediatric athletes because their number and their talent and their training volumes and intensities are increasing. Thanks very much, Craig, and I will hand over to Matt Wilson now.
Thank you, Craig. Uh, and on to our next uh, talk, which is um, probably uh, a very, very pertinent question that everybody has been asking for uh, and asking for an answer for, but with a lack of empirical data. And that is the evidence for cardiac involvement from COVID in athletes. With the evidence for cardiac involvement from COVID, we're fortunate to have Professor Sanjay Sharma with us. Um, I've known Sanjay Sharma since 1997 when he did my cardiac screening uh, when I was a, a, a budding triathlete uh, that unfortunately didn't go anywhere. Um, but Sanjay is a professor in sports cardiology at St George's Hospital London. Uh, many of you know him from his work uh, as the lead cardiologist for cardiac risk in the young for the past 20 years. And it, it is not... Uh, it, it goes without saying that he probably is a global authority on inherited heart muscle disease and a global orthodox cardiology uh, on top of his um, role with the, uh, the, the Olympic Games and medical director of the London Marathon. So without further ado, Sanjay is going to try and answer this very important question for us. Hello, my name is Sanjay Sharma. And I'll be speaking to you today about evidence for cardiac involvement from COVID in athletes. The following are my disclosures. The objectives of my talk are as follows. I'll be providing a background about the effects of COVID on the heart, providing an outline existing, uh, of existing methods to identify infected athletes with cardiac involvement. I will summarize the results of single center studies using cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging to detect myocarditis in mildly symptomatic athletes. And I'll describe the latest data from large studies in young professional and amateur athletes in the United States. So let's start with COVID and the heart. We know that SARS-CoV-2 is responsible for COVID-19 pandemic, and this is, this is associated with debilitating illness in 15%, critical illness in 4%, and an absolute mortality in 2%. The individuals that are at highest risk include the elderly and those with risk factors for atherosclerosis, such as obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, and those with cardiac and respiratory comorbidities. We know from data in Wuhan that between 25 to 30% of people admitted to hospital with COVID-19 infection had evidence of raised serum cardiac troponin indicative of myocyte necrosis and these individuals had a higher risk of adverse events, mechanical ventilation and death. Now, the precise mechanism of the raised troponin is unclear because we were unable to investigate these individuals due to limitation in resources and the fact that the hospitals were absolutely uh, reaming with these individuals. And therefore, we don't know the exact mechanism, but potential causes include a high circulating cytokine concentration resulting in systemic inflammation and causing myocardial inflammation, direct involvement of the heart causing myocarditis, high levels of circulating catecholamine levels causing a stress cardiomyopathy, profound hypoxemia resulting in my myocyte necrosis, the effect of inflammation and the hypercoagulable state resulting in myocardial infarction, and the profound hypoxemia and thromboembolic disease causing pulmonary hypertension and marked strain on the right ventricle. Clearly, one of the concerns in athletes is the risk of myocarditis. We have to stop just for a second and just remember that we're extrapolating data from the general population with multiple risk factors to athletes who have different demographic profiles and lower risk factors for atherosclerosis. Athletes are less likely to be obese or have risk factors for atherosclerosis. They usually don't have any cardiorespiratory comorbidities. They have better cellular and humoral immunity. They have reduced systemic inflammation and they have better organ perfusion. So they're much more likely to do better than the general population when infected with COVID-19 infection. But one must, what one must not forget is that myocarditis is an important cause of death in athletes. It's implicated in 5 to 15% of all sudden cardiac deaths in young athletes. And many of these individuals have been only mildly symptomatic prior to sudden death. 
Myocarditis has also resulted in 20% of all sudden cardiac deaths in military recruits. Clearly, the diagnosis of myocarditis has very important implications because it involves resting the heart in the early stages for up to three to six months. Some individuals with myocarditis may develop permanent left ventricular systolic dysfunction, which may exclude them from competitive sport in the future. And some individuals may be left with residual scar, the significance of which is unclear, and these individuals will require long-term surveillance for the risk of potentially serious ventricular arrhythmias. The diagnosis of myocarditis results in, uh, uh, is basically based on a compendium of multiple diagnostic tool, tools, including clinical features. Now, this is problematic in athletes who are asymptomatic or have only mild symptoms because the clinical features may be influenced solely by the chorizal illness or that they, they may be the any any symptoms of myocarditis may be completely masked. So in people who've got mild symptoms, clinical features don't really help very much. Viral serology is totally unhelpful. Biomarkers of cardiac damage are helpful, provided they are actually interpreted in clinical context. The ECG lacks sensitivity in the diagnosis of myocarditis. Echocardiography is normal in mild cases. And the sorts of investigations that give us the best yield, such as cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging scans, are, are not readily available in the current pandemic. And cardiac biopsies, which is, which is the most useful investigation, is only reserved for people with profound uh, heart failure or impending cardiogenic shock. So how do we identify athletes at risk? Now, you may recall that back in April or May, there was socioeconomic pressure on elite sport to return, not just for financial reasons, but also for the mental well-being of the general population. And clearly there were concerns that some of these individuals that may have been infected may be harboring silent myocarditis that could result in an adverse cardiac event. And therefore, there were some algorithms that were devised to assess these athletes who were COVID-19 positive. And this is one from the United States where if someone was COVID-19 positive, even if they had mild symptoms, the recommendation was that after they'd rested for about two weeks, they should have assessment with a triad of high, highly sensitive serum cardiac troponin levels, 12 lead ECG, and an echocardiogram with view to performing more detailed assessment if required. But things aren't quite as straightforward in athletes. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, most of the data that we know relating to COVID in the heart is derived from the elderly population. There was no data on the prevalence of COVID-19 related myocarditis at the time that these algorithms were being devised. We know that young individuals who have COVID have low mortality. In fact, the mortality is less than 0.1% in people under 20 and less than 1% in people under 40 years of age. Although serum cardiac troponin was recommended, this assessment is problematic in athletes because moderate to intensive exercise can result in high troponin levels in healthy athletes. We don't know the normal troponin concentrations in athletes and the 99th percentile values that we use to interpret troponins are derived from the general population rather than athletes. Although the ECG was recommended, I should point out that a significant proportion of athletes have re repolarization changes on the ECG consisting of J-point elevation, concave ST segments, tall T waves or slightly flattened T waves, which are normal in athletes and may result in false positive investigations. What you really need is an old ECG to compare with to see if there are any normal changes. Echocardiography can be useful, but we know that many athletes have dilated ventricles and a small proportion of endurance athletes have borderline low ejection fractions at baselines, which could result in false positive tests. The gold standard test, that's the CMR, is not available to, to all of us because there is an NHS backlog. The procedure takes between 40 to 50 minutes. We, re we need to cleanse the equipment and need a 20 minute following time. And even if we did have MRI scans for all athletes, 
there is absence of normative data. What is normal in an athlete? And we also know that some middle-aged endurance athletes have scar. So what we had initially suggested was a pragmatic approach, and that was to only investigate athletes that had moderate to severe symptoms or symptoms suggestive of cardiovascular disease. But then came along information about cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging scans in athletes from single centers. And these centers relied on the modified Lake Lewis criteria for the diagnosis of myocarditis, which requires one criterion from each of the two categories. First, myocardial edema, and second, the presence of non-ischemic myocardial injury. The presence of myocardial edema is gained from regional or global increase in the T2 signal using conventional images or T2 mapping. And this T2 signal is relatively specific for myocardial edema and is excellent in the diagnosis of acute myocarditis. Non-ischemic injury can be um, identified through native T1 images, uh, which also which not just look at T1, but also extracellular volume, or the presence of late gadolinium enhancement. T1 mapping is a sensitive marker for inflammation and excellent for ruling out um, inflammation. Late gadolinium enhancement usually identifies scar tissue. So that's what most of these studies used to identify myocarditis. So small studies that were published, one was by Rajpal in 26 collegiate athletes with a mean age of 19.5 years old. In this study, four athletes fulfilled criteria for myocarditis. Now these athletes were very mildly symptomatic and the vast majority had no rise in biomarkers for cardiac damage. But what was concerning was that almost half had evidence of myocardial scar. Now, the important thing about this paper was there were no control studies, so we had no idea about what would be found if you examined athletes who didn't have COVID, whether some of them may have very mild scar, linear scar, which may just be part of remodeling rather than disease. Another study in a larger cohort of collegiate athletes of similar age showed no obvious evidence of myocarditis, but revealed that around 40% of people with SARS-CoV-2 infection, albeit mildly symptomatic, had findings that could be compatible with pericarditis. Again, there was no control data here. And again, another, another um, criticism of this study was that there was no control data either. Then came a larger study which did co uh, compare COVID positive athletes with controller athletes. In this study, 59 athletes with COVID-19 infection underwent a battery of investigations, including ECG, troponin, echo, and cardiac MRI. And these data were compared with a data from 60 control athletes that, were, that had been collected retrospectively from the past and 24 healthy subjects. And what this study found uh, was that most athletes had very mild illness or were asymptomatic. And the MRI scan, I must point out, was performed three weeks after the actual infection process. This study found that only two athletes, that is 3%, were diagnosed with myocarditis and both were asymptomatic with normal preliminary investigations. It also found that right ventricular insertion point fibrosis was detected in 22% of COVID positive athletes but also in 24% of control athletes, suggesting that right ventricular insertion point fibrosis is not specific and should not be regarded as a marker of COVID-19 infection. This study also found that mild segmental increases in T1, T2 and extracellular volume were also present in 13% control athletes and 8% healthy athletes. So if we're going to try to make a diagnosis of myocarditis, we really, we really need to strictly adhere to the modified late Louise criteria and not put too much emphasis on a baseline slight increase in T1, T2 or extracellular volume until we've got normative data in a large group of our athletic cohorts. Then there was a larger CMR study 
uh, of 145 athletes, of which 74% were male. Again, these were young, mean age of 20 years old. The vast majority had mild to moderate symptoms and around 16% had, had no symptoms at all. This study found that only 1.4% of individuals had CMR findings compatible with myocarditis. And this group of investigators felt that it was pointless using MRI as a screen for myocarditis in all athletes. And maybe we should only be assessing athletes who truly had significant symptoms or cardiac symptoms. And then came probably the most welcome data. This is information from large studies in young, professional and collegiate athletes. Here is data from 789 professional athletes engaging in hockey, soccer and football. The mean age of these athletes was 25 and the vast majority were male. These individuals, once they had SARS-CoV-2 positive tests, underwent mandatory assessments with high sensitive troponin, ECG and echo. And as with most cases of athletes, the vast majority had mild or no symptoms. And in this study, 3.8% of athletes either had a raised troponin, 1.3% had an abnormal ECG, and 2.5% had an abnormal echo. And this may suggest that these preliminary tests are not worth doing because the diagnostic yield is low. But I should point out that most studies that have assessed athletes with these tests have done so 14 to 15 days after the onset of illness, by which time the troponin may have returned back to normal and any um, subtle uh, anomalies on the ECG may have recovered. Anyway, what's important here is that the diagnosis compatible with myocarditis was present in only five athletes. And this is very good news, suggesting that my, the, the actual prevalence of myocarditis is relative low, relatively low, sorry, in athletes who have been infected, only 0.6%. And then came probably the latest addition in um, our young collegiate athletes, which was a phenomenal study as far, study as, far as I'm concerned, because it involved over 3,000 athletes who had been infected with SARS-CoV-2. These athletes were young, uh, a third were female. And in this group, a significant proportion uh, had CMR based only on one on the presence of one or more triad of cardiac troponin, ECG or echocardiogram, and 190 underwent CMR irrespective of what the preliminary investigation showed. None of these athletes had severe illness. 13% had symptoms consistent with possible cardiac involvement. The prevalence of an abnormality in the triad of prelim preliminary tests was only 2.7%. So 2.7% either had a highly sensitive raised troponin, an abnormal ECG or an echocardiogram. And what's important here was that the prevalence of an abnormal CMR consistent with myocarditis was only 0.7%. And this involved 18% of those referred for an abnormal assessment, whether that abnormal assessment related to cardiac symptoms or an abnormality in one of the triad of the preliminary investigations that were used. But even more importantly was that, the, that moderate systemic illness or cardiac symptoms were the best predictors of probable or definite cardiac involvement. And that takes us back to the consensus paper that we wrote initially before PCR testing was available uh, widely. We felt that someone who was PCR positive and had symptoms uh, should self-isolate for seven days, which is the case now. But we suggested that we should only consider measurement of serum, cardiac troponin, echo, in though, echo and other tests in those who had a debilitating illness for more than seven days or those who had symptoms compatible with myocarditis. And these two tests, these two studies from the United States have shown that this consensus approach was probably correct and will remain to, to be so as, as this pandemic continues.
Clearly, if someone had no symptoms but tested positive, uh, we felt that they should exercise indoors and then return gradually uh, to training. And I'll talk about that briefly again. What about prognosis in athletes with cardiac involvement? The two studies from the United States did have some follow-up data, but this was quite, uh, quite small. In the larger study, the median follow-up was 130 days. That's almost four months. And in that period, there were no cardiac related events in athletes that were tested positive. So this is good news that the short term outlook in people who return to play is good. And this begs the question, how long should an athlete rest? I think no one will argue that an athlete that's infected with COVID-19 infection who has debilitating illness, a febrile illness for more than 72 hours, risk factors for an adverse cardiac event, breathlessness or chest pain, this sort of athlete should rest for one week after symptoms have resolved fully. They should respect self-isolation and they should monitor their symptoms carefully. But what about athletes that had a very transient illness lasting less than 72 hours, who had no risk factors and had no cardiac symptoms? The studies from the United States suggest that these people may resume as soon as they feel fit. And that's certainly our approach now at St. George's Hospital, that if you've got an athlete with very, with very mild symptoms that lasted two or three days that did not go be, beyond the neck, these people may go back to gradual training and go back to normal within a week of the onset of illness. So where does that actually leave us with COVID and the heart? We need to revisit the resting period after diagnosis, especially with Tokyo coming up and at least now striving to get there without being hampered by resting followed by a mild COVID infection. We need to investigate long-term outcomes in athletes with cardiac involvement. We need to obtain normative CMR data in athletes to enable more accurate assessment of athletes with COVID-19 infection in the future. And we need to start to evaluate the prevalence and management of long COVID in athletes. So in conclusion, the prevalence of cardiac involvement in athletes infected with COVID-19 infection is low. The short-term risk of a fatality in athletes with COVID-19 infection is also low. Illness of moderate severity or associated with cardiopulmonary symptoms has a higher diagnostic yield for cardiac involvement, it's, and it's those athletes that we should be assessing. I should also mention that the diagnostic yield of CMR is 4.2 fold greater when requested for clinical reasons rather than we, when used indiscriminately. So we should be only assessing athletes who have uh, moderate at systemic features or cardiac symptoms. And investigation, as I said before, is for myocarditis should be confined to athletes with dis disabling illness or athletes with cardiac symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sanjay, for that wonderful wrap up of the available data to date on this challenging topic um, that I think a lot of people have been crying out for answers and, 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 and you've clearly shown where the evidence currently is at the moment. Um, a couple of points to pick up on uh, and then we'll get into the questions. Guido and I have been looking after a number of athletes now post-infection um, who have been struggling um, in the return to play continuum uh, in this sort of stroke, long COVID, underperformance syndrome. And whilst their cardiac evaluations have been normal and their respiratory evaluations have been normal, the light has been normal. Light puts them into a bit of a deep hole. And the, and the thing that we found on, on CPET uh, is that anaerobic thresholds are shifted left and their heart rate response to exercise, even for very light exercise, is, um, is uh, really quite exaggerated. So very, very high heart rates for very, very low loads. In terms of your experience of, of supporting athletes come back to competition, how have you found that response? Is it a deconditioning issue for athletes that have never been ill and, and have never had a month off in their life before? Or is this a genuine issue that, that the COVID is having an issue with the autonomic system? Yeah, you make a very good point. Um, I clearly 
of, often sort of evaluate the the most the, the most elite athletes and it may be that the sort of athletes I'm involved uh, I'm assessing are, are much much harder and maybe pushing themselves irrespective of these problems but the one thing that we have noticed that athletes have complained of is that their heart rate recovery is definitely affected and no matter how normal their cardiopulmonary investigations are they complain of myalgia and, and muscle weakness and profound fatigue and I think the only treatment there is rest but the only, the only problem is that when you're dealing with the most elite athletes in whom the longer they rest, the longer they're going to cost their their, 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 their place in team selection. You know, just just measuring those ex expectations is difficult. Uh, but um, I think this is something that needs to be investigated. I was just speaking to the English Institute of Sport a few weeks ago. and They were saying that up to 25 percent of their athletes were experiencing these types of symptoms in the absence of cardi abnormal cardiac or respiratory problems on, on, on diagnostic testing. Um, another thing that we found in that cohort of, of elite athletes is whilst their cardiac MRIs are normal and their echo is normal and their resting ECG is normal, during exercise, quite a few of them are getting, quite a few of them are getting uh, arrhythmic issues. We've had a few athletes with bigemony, a few athletes with very, very short runs of non-sustained VT, which is very, very, which is almost abnormal. Um, in your experience, how common is, is the arrhythmic side of this rather than the, the structural side? I, I haven't, I can honestly say that in, in my experience, the athletes that I've in, uh, assessed, we haven't seen a high prevalence of ventricular or atrial arrhythmias okay. on exercise stress testing. One thing that we have seen clearly is that they, they have fatigued a bit more easily. And as you rightly point out, that their anaerobic thresholds have been lightly, slightly less and they've been slightly disappointed with their lactate thresholds compared to what they were, because that seems to be the number that they rely on so heavily. But I haven't seen a higher prevalence of uh, cardiac arrhythmias in our cohort as yet. Um, it's interesting to note on the papers looking at um, the incidental finding of RV insertion point fibrosis. And as somebody who has of the insertion point fibrosis, the long-term sequentially of this, and you know your 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 gut feeling on on that subject. Well, we've looked into this. We are, and we continue to look into it. Obviously, whenever there's scar in the heart, no matter what's caused it, one one's always slightly concerned. Um, what we established quite a few years ago was that about forty percent of young and veteran athletes have right ventricular insertion point fibrosis, and we also see it in. 10% of the general healthy young population as well. Uh, clearly in athletes, the mechanisms will be a mechanical stretch, you know, on and off mechanical stretch may be causing a little bit of wear and tear that heals with scar. We have not been able to link this scar with a higher burden of ventricular ectopy of ventricular arrhythmia. So I suspect this is probably a, a, a repair mechanism, just as you get in your Achilles tendon if you've been running all the time. That's not going to cause problems in the future. That's my personal feeling. Uh, a, a question here from, I one would assume it would be a, an Italian physician. Uh, exercise ECG with, uh, with O2 sats is included in the Italian return to play for post-COVID athletes, but not included in these return to play for post-COVID athletes foundations. Uh, can, you, uh, can you explain why? Well, it really depends on why we're doing the exercise. Why? It really depends on why we're doing the exercise stress test. I mean, if we're doing exercise stress tests in someone who's clearly the, the sort of people that we're going to be in, investigating are those that have actually have symptoms because we don't normally recommend assessment in every single athlete who's had a COVID-19 infection. So clearly, if someone's got cardiopulmonary symptoms, my practice is that we do uh, use oximetry. We we have to we have to we we check for desaturation just as we do. That check for heart rate and blood pressure responses in these individuals. So I think it's it's important in an athlete complaining of dyspnea or early fatigue that exercise oximetry is employed. And we'll wrap this up before we move on to Kim's talk. But um, in your experience, are there any marked differences between male and female athletes in terms of symptoms or the prevalence? Uh, and what does the data show? I can only go by our experience and uh, the, our, the experience isn't great, great. it's not huge, uh, but I have definitely found that uh, our females have prolonged recovery and they also have a higher prevalence of non-specific 
neurological symptoms as well, such as paresthesia and various things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sanjay, we could talk for hours on this subject, but we're out of time. We, we need to move on to Kim. So thank you so much for 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 that. Um, you know, most people know you uh, and know your contact details. So if anybody has any additional questions, um, we can get those answered. Um, we move next on to our next talk, um, which is Kim Harmon uh, and a subject very close to my heart, which is uh, cardiac screening to identify uh, abnormalities in the athletes. Um, Kim is um, a sports medicine physician based out of Seattle. Uh, she's a professor in the departments of family medicine and orthopedics at the University of Washington. She is a rock star uh, and was the author of the previous paper that Sanjay just uh, showed you. Uh, she's past president of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine in 2009-2010 um, and is currently president for the educational board of that. Uh, her experience in collegiate sport uh, and professional sport in America is second to none. Um, Kim, Kim, over to you and your talk, please. Good morning. I'd uh, like to thank Matt and Guido for inviting me to speak. I'm really happy to be uh, with you today. And um, today I am going to be talking about, is it time for targeted rather than universal cardiac screening in athletes? And so this is the topic that I was giving and we're gonna try and uh, get through this and, and see if we can get some answers to it. So what is universal cardiac screening? I think that that's what we should start with first. And Really, there's not widespread agreement on a universal cardiac screening strategy. In um, the UK, the UK National Screening Committee does not currently recommend systematic population screening for cardiac conditions associated with sudden cardiac death in the young, although there are certainly places um, that uh, advocate differently and where cardiac screening goes on um, significantly. In the United States, back in 1996, the American Heart Association recommended that some form of pre-participation cardiovascular screening be done for high school and college athletes, and actually even called it justifying and compelling based on ethical, legal, and medical grounds. However, what they recommended was that we do a history and physical for screening, um, calling it the best available and most practical approach to screening for cardiovascular disease, while at the same time recognizing that the history and physical really had very limited ability to actually find it, anything. And so that always has seemed a little at odds with me to recommend something that doesn't really work. This position was affirmed in 2007 and 2014. The American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, which is a group of sports medicine physicians, not cardiologists, um, got together in 2016 and um, took a different approach or recommended a different approach. They recognized that there was individual risk for everybody and that there was different resources available in terms of physician expertise and cardiology resources and really did recommend a targeted approach. And so this is from the AMSSM. Um, yeah, so advocating that targeted approach that we're talking about today. In um, Europe, in, 20, in, in 2005, um, a 12-lead ECG was recommended. And this is really sort of the first recommendation that was made in this regard and started off a bit of debate. It's interesting that in 2020, the new ESC recommendations uh, didn't really come out and recommend a 12-lead ECG but instead sort of put together the, the risk and the benefit, saying most experts believe that early detection can save lives, that cardiovascular screening by H&P and ECG present challenges and limitations, that the H&P uh, has low sensitivity and specificity for finding these conditions and ECG outperforms them, and then also adding that ECHO may identify structural disorders um, that aren't necessarily associated with sudden cardiac death. Our friends down under in Australia and New Zealand came out with a statement in 2018 where they recommended using 12 lead ECG for um, elite athletes, but for young competitive and recreational athletes recommended they could just compete without any sort of screening at all. And so you can see that there's really a wide variety of recommendations out there around the world, 
in terms of how to screen. And so there is no common universal screening recommendation right now of who to screen or how to screen. And in fact, um, I think that there's growing consensus that the history of physical doesn't really work for cardiovascular screening. It's good for some things, but in terms of actually trying to prevent sudden cardiac death or identify those things associated with sudden cardiac death. Um, this statement it was from the Inter-Association Consensus Statement um, that was uh, led by Brian Hainline, um, who is a chief medical officer of the NCAA, and um, uh, that was their conclusion. Again, back to the AMSSM position statement, there uh, was again a recommendation that the current pre-participation examination, which includes history and physical examination, is practical, but it's really limited in its ability to identify these different things. So there's growing consensus that the 12 lead ECG is the best way to screen for cardiovascular conditions in young competitive athletes. So if we think about screening um, and whether we should do it or not, it's hard to, to really sort of even have a conversation about that without going back to these classic screening criteria by Wilson and Younger that were put forth in 1968. I mean, that's over 50 years ago, and they still really have stood the test of time. And there's been multiple sort of iterations of this and, and, and people trying to um, improve them and um, maybe update them or modernize them. And this one right here from the World Health Organization um, recommends that any screening program should respond to recognized need. And I think that that certainly sudden cardiac death is, is, is a uh, recognized need. The objectives of screening need to be defined at the outset. And here, um, the WHO really recommends that there be a defined target population. And so when we're thinking about whether it should be universal screening or targeted screening, the WHO might agree with a more targeted approach. So if we're thinking about a targeted approach, who should our target target uh, uh, population be? Well, that really starts into a conversation about how often does this occur and who, who should we really target? And if you look at incident studies in athletes, and these are um, just in athletes, not in the general population, there's really sort of a wide variety in terms of how often different studies have shown that this occurs. And the rates range from one in 2,500, which was this uh, uh, study by Chattard in 2018 in Pacific Islanders, to one in 300,000, which is um, some earlier studies back in the late 90s or mid 90s. And so um, the primary reason for differences in these studies is really methodology. And so I think if we look a little bit closer, um, we might have a better idea of, of who to target. So we know that there's an age distribution of sudden cardiac death, and we certainly see that going up somewhere around 25. And that's because that's the contribution of um, a coronary artery disease um, in, in cardiovascular death. And so if we're looking for things that are congenital, things that we can find on an ECG, then it seems to make sense that we would target people that are less than 25 uh, to find these types of things. And so um, if we can try and get a little bit more granular in this age group, it might help us decide who we should target. And so I'm going to go back to this um, study that our group did in 2015. And this looked at NCAA athletes. Now in the United States, uh, as you know, our athletic system is really tied into our colleges and universities. And the nice thing about doing research in this population is that we have very granular information in terms of who's participating. And so we know how many males there are, how many females there are, what sport they play. And um, really unique to many of these databases, we know their race and ethnicity. And so if you look at um, the 10 year in incidents, and this includes data from 2003 to 2000. 13, um, the overall incidence in athletes that are about 18 to 22, really they go up to 24, but, but in general, the vast majority of these young athletes are between the ages of 18 and 22. Their incidence is about one in 53,000. We have an additional six, seven uh, years of data um, um, 
for this database, and, and these numbers really haven't changed much at all. Um, the incidence in males is much higher than the incidence in females, one in 38,000 compared to 120,000. And so, you know, there could be an argument made that we just should target males in screening and not females. And additionally, when you look at differences in our black athletes compared to our white athletes, the incidence of sudden cardiac death in our black athletes is about 1 in 20,000 compared to our white athletes, which is close to 1 in 70,000. And so as we get a little bit more granular detail, it might suggest who we might target. You can get even more granular than that by looking at different sports. And one of the interesting things that first came out when we started looking at this is that there appears to be sports that are higher risk. And we don't really know if this is because of the nature of the sport or uh, the athletes that seem to be selected out to pay, play particular sports. But men's basketball in particular seems to be very high risk. And it's not just this study that has shown that, but um, other studies as well. And the risk of sudden cardiac death in a men's basketball athlete in the NCAA is somewhere around, around 1 in 9,000. Um, also soccer, men's soccer is, is high risk at 1 in 24,000 and men's football at 1 in 35,000. The sort of average rate here of NCAA athletes is 1 in 53,000. And so, you know, maybe we should target everything that's above um, this average rate. Um, or maybe we should just, again, just look at men. You can see the first women's sport that comes in here is women's cross country, which is about the average. And so we could think about this in terms of just targeting certain sports. And there is other um, uh, information as well um, and data. And so this study also from our group looks at um, the incidence of sudden cardiac death and sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and so the numbers are a little bit different because they include sudden cardiac arrest as well. This is from the years of 2014 and 2018. So they're after the NCAA data that I just showed you. And it includes athletes 11 to 29 years old. And what this shows, um, not surprisingly, in the NCAA athletes is that uh, the numbers are very, very close to what I showed you before. Um, these are sort of sliced and diced a little bit differently. And one of the things that you can see is that the risk of um, sudden cardiac death in a male basketball player in Division I, which is really the most competitive of um, uh, the divisions that we have in our college sports, um, is 1 in 2,000. And so that's, that's really quite high. If you look at the high school athletes, um, the rates are not as high here, and this is probably primarily because most of these reports come from media reports, and um, the, uh, the, the, the media reports are just not it, um, as potentially news, newsworthy or, or um, interesting to people um, when a high school athlete dies compared to a more high-profile athlete. But here, ice hockey appears to be a uh, high-risk sport. And then, of course, we see football, basketball, and soccer. And so some, some common themes coming out. And then in this paper um, by the, the uh, CRY group, and Neil Mahutra's group, um, the incidence of sudden cardiac death was 1 in 14,000. Um, and so very, very high. And so if we try to sort of put this all together, we see in um, the studies where there is more granular information in terms of males, females, uh, black athletes, white athletes, that they're all pretty consistent in terms of their estimations of risk. And it's not surprising because they uh, were all using sort of similar data sources. Um, and the themes that come out is that male athletes are three to six times more likely than female athletes to have a sudden cardiac arrest or death. And that black athletes are two to five and a half times more likely than white athletes to have a sudden cardiac arrest or death. And if we look at incidence data in male sports, again, we see these common themes coming out that football, basketball, and soccer are our highest risk athletes. So who should we target? Um, athletes under 25, maybe? Male athletes? Black athletes? Male football, basketball, and soccer athletes? There's all arguments that can be made for these particular groups. Um, if we try and maybe frame this risk in terms of, of uh, what is this compared to other things, in that study of NCAA athletes that we did, we also looked at, at causes of death from anything. 
And you can see that the risk of death from a motor vehicle accident was one in 26,000, and that was really the only thing that was higher than the risk of sudden cardiac death. And so this um, represents a significant cause of death in our in our um, athlete population and potentially a preventable one if we identify athletes before this. And I just want to compare this to the screening strategy in the United States, at least, um, of a sickle cell trait. And so sickle cell trait is associated with an increased risk of exertional death. And right now uh, in the NCAA, we are required to screen all athletes for sickle cell trait, um, uh, or they have to sign a waiver saying that, that they uh, don't want to be screened. And you know, this is something where really um, the risk varies dramatically with uh, different demographic factors. So one in 12 African-Americans or black athletes will have sickle cell trait compared to one in 6,000 Caucasian or white athletes. And so it seems to make sense that um, it would be reasonable to screen black athletes for this. In addition, all the deaths over the last 50 years um, have been um, primarily in, in Division I football. And so if you wanted to prevent deaths from sickle cell trait, you could potentially say just screen your football athletes or just screen your black football athletes. But this has caused significant concern. And, um, you know, when I think about sort of what we decide to screen for, a lot of it is, is sort of what is splashy and what is scary. And um, so when you think about death from shark attacks, I mean, everybody's afraid of sharks and sometimes we don't go in the water because of sharks, but sharks really only kill about five people a year. And if we compare that to other things, I mean, cows and horses kill about 20 people a year. Um, hippos uh, kill almost 3,000 uh, people a year and mosquitoes kill 725,000 uh, people a year. But most of us aren't super scared of mosquitoes, um, but uh, may avoid swimming in the ocean because of sharks, particularly after you've watched uh, Shark Week on TV. And so sometimes it's these things that, that uh, are more dramatic that really draw our attention. So where do we draw the line? Um, do we draw it after um, men's basketball? Um, do you say just the men? I mean, that's really the question. And it brings up some very difficult ethical issues. And so maybe it's not just a sort of, um, uh, we're gonna say everything above one in 50,000 gets, gets um, screened, there's also these ethical issues. And so there's a question of whether screening some athletes and not others is discriminatory. So if you only screen um, one group of athletes, the group that you don't screen doesn't risk disqualification. And so if you're only screening, say, black athletes, it could be considered discriminatory because um, because uh, you are only potentially disqualifying that particular group of athletes. Sort of conversely, even though groups, some groups are lower risk than others, they're not no risk. And so you could say, statistically, it makes sense to screen just men for sudden cardiac death. But there are certainly women that die from sudden cardiac risk. And so when somebody's daughter has a sudden cardiac uh, death and they weren't screened, that's a hard question to answer as to sort of why wasn't my daughter screened and my son was. And so um, there, there are ethical issues and, and uh, that, that come into play here as well. And there's also an issue of resources. So if you're going to screen somebody, you need adequate resources to screen. And this includes someone to interpret screening tests correctly. And many places um, uh, there aren't people that can read ECGs uh, very well and may either miss things or um, um, order a bunch of secondary testing that's not necessary. Um, and, and then you, the, the secondary testing needs to be available. If you can't get an echo for, for a month or two after you have an abnormal ECG, are you really doing anybody any, any favors? And if you can't get an MRI, a cardiac MRI, um, does it really make sense to sort of uh, begin to look at these things at all? And so, so there also needs to be an understanding of what happens to athletes that are positive. And so if you find somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what happens? Do, do 
do you have the right to say you can't participate on my team because I'm um, concerned that uh, you might have a, a, a sudden cardiac death event? Um, or does that athlete get to decide more of, of, of a shared decision making model? And so it also brings up all these other sorts of um, difficult questions. And so the, the final thing I think that we want to think about with screening is, is does screening present a barrier to participation? Because we certainly understand that there is a health benefit to being physical act, physically active, um, both uh, you know, physical and emotional. Um, um, there's all sorts of uh, benefits to physical activity. And if we say you have to have a certain screening, say an ECG prior to participation, are we then precluding a group of people from participating because they can't get that ECG? And so um, I, I don't think that we want to put barriers up to participation. And then, you know, I, I mean, if we look at other models of screening, can we learn any lessons from this? Well, you know, um, certainly men get breast cancer, but there's not really, it, it's not super controversial that men are not screened regularly with mammograms. Similarly, um, you know, people that are under the age of 40 or 50 develop colon cancer, but I don't see many 20 year olds clamoring to get their colonoscopy right away. And so, again, there's a, there's a lot of different um, things that need to be considered when considering a, a screening program and a one size fits all approach may not be um, the thing that we want to promote. And so is it time for targeted rather than universal cardiac screening? You know, I would actually say, say absolutely. Um, but the question um, really becomes, you know, how do we define that population? And so any screening program should be targeted towards those that are high risk of, of, of uh, the condition. But we really need better and more granular research in terms of who that is so that we can define that a little bit better. It does seem clear that there are higher risk groups and those include males, black athletes and, and certain sports. Um, and also sort of resources and risk tolerances are different. Maybe it makes sense to have an aggressive screening programs in professional sports where there is a larger resources available compared to, to youth sports. So uh, potentially thinking about something like um, like the Australian or New Zealand recommendations. And um, finally, I'd just like to reiterate once again that we don't want to create barriers to participation because even though uh, sudden cardiac death um, occurs and kills our athletes more frequently than many other things, it's still relatively low risk and there are so many benefits to physical activity. And so uh, with that, um, I hope that um, you maybe have a, a couple of things to uh, think about it. Um, I do think that it is time that we that we um, move from a one size fits all approach and, and think about a more targeted approach and um, do the research that's necessary to really define who those high risk populations are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, for a really very sensible and pragmatic approach to a difficult subject. I know a lot of the CMOs that we talk to here in the United Kingdom who are responsible for looking after athletes and their, their medical and responsible for physical mental well-being, budgetary constraints behind a lot of the decisions that they make and trying to find a sensible solution for uh, one element of cardiac, of cardiac screening is certainly a difficult for them. Internationally, though, however, um, you know, unlike the UK and the, United, uh, and the United States, a lot of places don't have access to a lot of advanced follow-up diagnostics, such as cardiac MR. And as you say, echocardiogram, we know that some of our international athletes might not have that access in the country. So in your experience, should people actually the country, in your experience, if you don't have the ability to do follow-up? Yeah, I don't I don't think that there's a lot of um, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to screen if you can't do the follow up, because then you just have people that uh, can are, are potentially worried that they have something. And more often than not, uh, they, they don't have anything. And so it just uh, either puts up a barrier for, for 
participation or, or creates anxiety. And so I don't think you, you have ready access to the follow-up and the expertise that you need that you should screen. Mm. Another thing that we another thing that we, that we, we often um, talk about is, is when to start screening. Uh, and in your data, your, your NCAA data is looking at the underage of 35. The European Society of Cardiology suggests between 12 and 14 or the onset of their uh, of, a, of an athletic career. But in terms of high risk groups, is have you noticed any differences in your high risk groups by penetrance, age penetrance for these diseases? Or is that does it 12 to 14 sound sensible universally? Yeah, I think 12 to 14 certainly sounds sensible. It makes sense. Um, the data that I'm familiar with doesn't suggest that the that the incident is quite as high then. However, that's, I think, really because of a lack of data rather than an actual um, uh, lack of, of issues there. And so, um, you know, I, I think just practically that starting at the age around 12 to 14, uh, looking at doing every other year, every third year. In the United States, people sort of go up at different levels of school, middle school, high school, and then college. And so doing it at those intervals uh, makes sense. Um, but um, I do think, you know, as as um, we, we've seen in other groups, that it is important to, it's not just sort of a one and done phenomena. You need to uh, keep screening this because uh, many of these things develop as, as people develop uh, through, um, through through puberty and, and, and into young adulthood. I mean, well, that, that leads nicely onto my next question because we have uh, only yesterday I received an email from a team physician saying, look, our athletes were screened two years ago. Um, when should we be screening them again? Uh, in your experience in the NCAA data, particularly within those high risk groups, is it a, a yearly event? Is it biannually or is it um, at the start of their career and once every five years? What would be a sort of sensible starting point? Well, you know, where we've landed at my institution is that we do our um, men's basketball players yearly um, and we do everybody else bi-yearly. And so, uh, it, you know, sometimes people will uh, take a little bit longer to get through school than others, and so sometimes they'll get screened three times. Um, but most for for many people, it's just when they get there, and then and then going into their third year. And you know, it's interesting because we find things, and um, uh, I think that this was really quite clear. You know, we recently did a project where we uh, there was a lot of screening that went on in the United States with COVID and post COVID, and so people that were screening or they screened only at uh, one time and came in, they ended up finding um, a lot of things that were related to sudden cardiac death. We didn't find so many things related to COVID, but, but more things related uh, to uh, potentially causing sudden cardiac death than actually problems from COVID. And that I thought that was an interesting exercise and outcome of that study. Prior to me working at this institute, I worked in the Middle East in a, in a facility called Aspatar, and a lot of the athletes through the Federation had to have compulsory screening. So, so we, we were doing yearly medicals on some individuals um, four, five, six, seven times in their athletic career. Uh, and interestingly, we also found the same. So, you know, they could have had five consecutive normal screens, and on the sixth year, they've had an abnormal ECG, and it's the early start of the expression of a, of a potential disease. So it's interesting that you're also seeing something similar there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been, um, you know, definitely, uh, you, you definitely have those athletes where they have a little bit of um, uh, T-wave inversion one way and you do a workup and, and you don't see anything and then it gets worse the next year and, and then you find something when you do the, the secondary workup the next year or the year after that. And so um, certainly with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it is something that expresses itself a little bit later. And so uh, continuing to screen as athletes develop is important. Well, Kim, we'll leave it there and I will pick up, pick up um, and I'll, I'll steal your, your line about barriers, screening is a barrier because that's the next question that we're going to be talking with Guido Pierlez on, on what to do with an individual who's been identified through a cardiac screening program and is being picked up with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, Kim, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, and we'll move next on to uh, uh, Guido. So Guido is um, head of sports cardiology here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health.
uh, and is an associate professor for UCL. Uh, his medical degree is from Germany and he has a DPhil at Oxford University in cardiovascular genetics. Uh, he is also a, uh, a, a pediatric and adult congenital uh, uh, specialist working at the Bristol Heart Institute and the, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Um, Guido, the floor is yours. Over to you, please. Thank you very much um, to everyone for joining our um, web conference and of course a big thank you to our ISEH team uh, for organizing this conference. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit on the thinking but also the data when it comes to um, letting athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy return to play or indeed continue to play at a competitive level. Um, I'm um, here, the lead sports cardiologist at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, and I'm very proud to have joined such a formidable team. And let's delve into the matter. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the commonest cardiomyopathy, um, the incidence probably 1, 200 per year in adults. And the classical textbook cardiomyopathy case um, is like this. You can see ECG changes such as septal hypertrophy, lateral T-wave inversion, and this particular 19-year-old um, patient has also ST depression, ischemic changes, and repolarization changes during exercise. And if we look at this imaging, then again, we see classic textbook hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a hugely hypertrophic septum. This is around three meters with um, impaired systolic, but mainly diastolic um, function and also some obstruction of the outflow tract here. And why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because our early recommendations on non-eligibility for athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, was usually based on this kind of uh, patient clientele. The clientele, these were the patients that were looked at to say, well, they are not allowed to do sports. And this is and for many of them probably correct because with severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as in this case, um, exercise has a high risk for sudden cardiac death. However, it is um, more difficult um, to do this when we look at athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What I've shown you here is a um, diagram to look at the different cardiomyopathies. We can concentrate on Hokem. And our patient I've just shown you, he's probably here and a decision on sports or not is fairly easy. But he would have been negatively selected by sheer exercise intolerance anyway to do any competitive sport. So the um, population we are looking at with athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is this gray zone here, because this might incorporate athletes who have normal physiological adaptations such as left ventricular hypertrophy, but also athletes who have a beginning, mild, sometimes even subclinical phenotype. And these are the ones we need to make a decision on um, should they do competitive sports or not. So the decision is much more having looking at this 16-year-old um, um, healthy athletes with hypertrophy and looking at this um, age-matched male athlete with a beginning cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you're an expert, you might see that maybe it's a bit thicker and maybe the diastolic function is not normal, but it is extremely difficult to differentiate. And he does not have uh, many symptoms, but he has cardiomyopathy. Is he allowed to play or not? This is um, the question we are uh, trying to answer um, and have been trying to answer over the last years. What do we use? It's very easy. We use the, uh, in, uh, I'm talking here tongue in cheek, of course. We use the left ventricular um, wall thickness. How thick is your cardiac muscle? And we know if it's above 13 millimeters, well, that is, likely cardiomyopathy, but we also see a proportion of athletes here that uh, have a normal heart and have um, a left ventricle as thick as this. And this uh, in another, um, if I may say so already, classic uh, study, if Sanjay allows me to say this, then it is also true for junior adolescent athletes. Uh, training adaptations do exist and we have a, many healthy athletes who have a uh, physiological hypertrophy that reaches the limits where we would normally diagnose it as cardiomyopathy. And we thought 
that is easy. We can use these um, diameters to diagnose, but it's not quite that easy. And particularly is this illustrated at one of my favorite papers from the uh, Sharma group, where which illustrates, I think, where previous recommendation have not really hit the target. Because previously athletes were compared to sedentary um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Huh? And this is how the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy expresses itself. There's a so-called septal type, which I've shown you in the first picture. So patients have a hugely increased septum size, but the other um, parts of the ventricle are normal. However, if we look at athletes with Hoken, and this is a group we need to compare, we need to deal with, then we see that 14% of athletes with a pathological hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have actually what we call concentric hypertrophy, which means concentric hypertrophy is usually thought of as a benign training adaptation. So when we make any recommendations on eligibility, we cannot um, compare sedentary Hocum patients and draw data from there. We need to look at athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Because of course, because we're talking here about eligibility, so it's very important to say, well, why do we need to decide on this? What is the risk of a cardiac event? What is the risk of sudden cardiac death? And this will be the determinator while we let um, this uh, athlete down here maybe not compete or we do. So what is the data? Well, the data, and I have to say this is superbly summarized in a recent um, um, article in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that really weighs very carefully the pro and cons for eligibility. Um, and this is also, of course, an expert review with all the papers, all the data you would want to have in there. So what is our sudden cardiac death rate in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, it's more than 5% in many of them, not in all, and it can be much, much higher. And the risk for sudden cardiac death in non-athlete patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is commonly really related to heart failure, dilatation of the atria, which causes atrial fibrillations, and then LV wall thickness, as I've shown you, of 30 millimeters, and also previous cardiac arrests. And of course, arrhythmias. But apart from family history and arrhythmias, often in athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, these risk factors are not there. There is no athlete who competes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who is in heart failure. So if we want to risk stratify again, we need to have specific data for athletes. And this is not in abundance, but we do have data. And interestingly enough, um, while there is a great variety of studies which, and of results, which also shows that the methodology in these studies, which are most often retrospective and observational, is not what we would want. But however, the sudden cardiac death rate is between 0.1 but or 6.6%, which is fairly high. And we also know, and that does help us with risk stratification on eligibility, that the risk is higher in black male athletes and also in high intensity stop and go sports, which often go beyond the anaerobic threshold, such as basketball, American football and soccer. So yes, there is a high sudden cardiac death rate and it is important that we do think about eligibility or not. So the next question is, of course, if we do this, is the high volume and high intensity of exercise, training and competition to blame for cardiac arrests in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in athletes? Well, most data shows, yes, 50, over 50% 50 of sudden cardiac events or sudden cardiac deaths, in fact, in athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy occurs during or around the time of exercise. There are, however, other studies who show that a large proportion has sudden cardiac arrest also during sleep. So this is still a much discussed topic. But I think we can safely say, yes, exercise at high intensities, particularly increase the risk for events in Hocum patients. Why is it like this? Well, there's an adrenergic surges, there's dehydration, um, but also there's a high metabolic demand. and. Uh, uh, my uh, previous uh, PG department um, in Oxford around you, Watkins, they do rightly say that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is to a big part maybe a myocardial energy substrate and depletion disease. And that's important because that means if you work anaerobically, and there's some initial data now saying this, this is when your myocytes in cardiomyopathy and um, your muscle cells do not work well, and this creates arrhythmias, which can lead to sudden cardiac. Um, rest, arrest. Oh, so exercise all bad in Hocum. 
No, it's not. And this is the big dilemma. This is a study with non-athletes, but with patients um, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it looked at the fitness level of these patients and what their fitness associated outcome is. And you can clearly see if you've got a MET above 100% for your age group, your long-term outcome is so, so much better than as if you were an unfit broken patient. And this is important to the point that actually other factors, for example, left ventricular artery tract obstruction, which we know is a risk factor for sudden cardiac arrest, is actually less important than fitness level. So fitness will prolong your life if you have hokum. Is this always true? Well, again, debated, but there is certainly enough evidence. What does it look like in athletes? And here there's a, a much cited study from Antonio Pelicia's group, it's very recent, that looked at competitive athletes, although um, the competitive level was um, varying between these athletes, and looked at cardiac events in athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who did continue to perform competitive sports, this is the red, and athletes who had hokum who did not continue. And what you can see is that the event-free survival is the same and the risk of sudden cardiac death is not higher in the athletes with Hokum continued with the exercise. In fact, what you can see after 20 years, it probably plays in if you don't do much sports, you might have um, acquired cardiovascular risk, risk factors and your event-free survival is actually lower in this uh, group. So this gives evidence that maybe it isn't too um, risky to continue. Uh, doing competitive sports. So how do we make a decision on this? I think we have a lot of data. We have not complete data and I want to show you uh, in the end uh, also where I think we need more data. Of course we all talked about it. It's a shared decision but I would also like to say it's an informed decision and I would also like to say that shared decision does not mean we oblige as medical professionals to the choice and to the wish of the athlete. It is a much more of a process which need to be done in an athlete friendly environment where this can be done over several conversations and then make an informed decision. Of course, it's a huge uh, impact, um, psychological, financial and um, lifestyle on the athletes if he has to stop. But sudden cardiac events in public um, have also a huge impact on the general public and us as medical professionals have to be really careful and the pendulum swung from prohibiting athletes to do exercise, maybe to being free um, to, uh, in, the, in our decision to let them do this. But I think we need to find a middle ground that takes all of this into account. And of course, there are also legal and ethical considerations and they're different in very many countries. So this is very important and requires data, firstly, cardiology data, and then also um, this, as I said, shared um, process. What can help us? Well, this is from the paper from around John Dresner, which I said, and this is a decision aid. And this is, a, again, as I say, said, well thought through and, and a very, um, a very balanced um, decision aid. And it takes into a lot of factors that we have. However, it naturally, because of the lack of evidence, leaves also out a lot of factors. And it's also a linear model. And what I mean by this is, it is not individualized because most of our athletes will have something from here, something from here and something from here. They don't fit into these categories. And this is a general problem by making these decisions. Um, of course, there's also the um, um, ESC uh, uh, sports cardiology recommendations for athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, as I cited down here. And this is an important document, it's recently um, written, so this will get have a lot of guidance as well. And it is clear that we are much more liberal um, letting athletes compete. But I want to go back for the last two minutes uh, still to um, look at our FA data again that um, was published two years ago. And here are the sudden cardiac death cases. And what it says here is blind reading, reviewing again of the data now, would have not picked up, for example, this um, young um, player with cardiomyopathy. Why is that? Many people would say, well, because your screening doesn't work. This is a very superficial argument. I think there are other reasons why this might not have been. Firstly, we do need more data, but also I think the other very important lesson is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is unpredictable in its phenotype and it's an involving disease. I see in the NHS children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy 
cardiomyopathy and adults. And it is it's very, very informing to see how this phenotype, which is rarely there, develops and then becomes proper hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in adults. But then going back retrospectively, sometimes I can even see, well, maybe we could have picked it up earlier. What do we need to do to pick it up early? We need to mod monitor regular. And this means monitoring and profiling um, of um, athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is not screening, but athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy need to be seen six monthly and they need a whole arsenal of cardiac investigations at rest and during exercise. This is important. And maybe we need to also look back at um, pediatric athletes. I'm not ad advocate, advocating here for screening every 10 year old athlete, but we need to identify the high risk ones where there may be a family history um, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And these needs to be, need to be seen. And maybe also we can then anticipate and also discuss with early teenage athletes, maybe it is not um, the right choice to try to become a um, professional football player and rather concentrate on the GCSE levels. Uh, I think these are all opportunities we can use if we screen younger athletes. Short word on return to play with ICD. Um, uh, this, this much cited paper by Rachel Lampert shows that the event rate with ICDs in competitive sport is not uh, is lower than we think. And um, you will have seen there are many uh, competitors who are uh, there in athletics, football with an ICD. Contact sports are contraindicated, but I presume we will see um, more athletes uh, competing with an ICD and as a medical community, we need to um, provide guidance for this. Last big question is, well, genetics. Why can we not do gene tests? Well, 60%, it is true of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, are monogenic, there's one gene um, in the myocardium responsible for it. We can test for this. Yes, and there are risk genotypes. I do this in my clinic a lot. If there are certain genes, there's a higher risk, for example, with troponin mutations for sudden cardiac um, arrhythmic events before I can see the phenotype on the echo. However, there's incomplete penetrance. Often the genotype, the phenotype in families with the same gene does not correlate. Some people have a, have a severe disease, some people don't. And then there's this thing, modifier genes. 3,000 genes plus are involved in the heart morphology and function. And there are many who are um, changing the um, hypertrophic cardiac phenotype. So we've done a study in Toronto with young adolescent um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients where we looked at, um, they all had a mutation in one of the um, classic genes. And we looked at other genes, for example, HIF1, alpha, VEGF, who only have marginally uh, a role in the myocardium. But if they had a small mutation in them as well, they had a more severe phenotype, they had a higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest. So this leaves us really in a bit of a dilemma. It's not only one gene, there will be more. And that's why I said we need, we need network analysis that is non-linear. But this means AI, I don't want to put this um, flashy word up here, but I do think we need to have a personalized network um, profiling and risk certification. And maybe over the next 10 years, we can do it, but we can do an individual, tell an individual athlete what his risk is. What can we do until then? Are there any new um, um, technologies, methodologies? Yes, and we're using it here at ICH and we've developed it like many other groups uh, also before to assess the athlete, not only at rest, but during exercise, meaning doing imaging during exercise, but also doing stress ECG and cardiopulmonary exercise tests at the same time. So, because in the end, as I said, sudden cardiac death in Holcomb happens a lot during exercise. This is an echo at rest, and this is a methodology called strain imaging, where I can directly measure the myocardium. Another new um, technology we are using in cardiomyopathy. But it would be much better to do this during exercise, to see really how the heart of the athlete is functioning during exercise. Why is this particularly important during Holcomb? Well, initial data from uh, Toronto where I worked shows that in adolescents patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if they have a mild phenotype or only genetics at rest, this is here, you cannot differentiate between a control in red and between a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you let them exercise and you do exercise echo, as I've just shown you, during exercise, suddenly you've got the scissoring effects and you can diagnose patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because their function does not increase during exercise, which it should earlier. So exercise imaging um, can 
um, and this is a bit of a hypothesis, this can, but we're using it, can um, diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly in well people such as athletes earlier. This is all I wanted to say. So in summary, a blanket disqualification in Hokum is not supported any longer by the data. However, the data also shows the risk for sudden cardiac death remains significant. What can we do? We can lower this risk or estimate this risk better by doing an individual risk stratification and by longitudinal, regular expert monitoring of these athletes. And there are new methods which will help us diagnose and monitor athletes better. I've shown you some of them, but I think also we need in the next decade a more individualized and network-based individual risk stratification. Shared decision finding and making in combination with these tools, I think will make it possible for some, if not many athletes to compete safely in competitive sport. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guido, for uh, that talk and a review of the data. It seems very pragmatic and, and sensible to date as the data evolves. It's good to see that the, the, the evolution of a more liberal approach to this, but um, particularly within hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I think the data is there for conditions such as arrhythmogenic right stroke cardiomyopathy, uh, where the progression of the disease is worsened by high intensity exercise. But in terms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, what data is out there to say that actually high intensity exercise could actually make the condition worse or put the individual at a, at a heightened susceptible risk for an arrhythmia? Thanks, Matt. Well, there's not much data out but, out, but there are some trials. There are some trials going on in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In patients, um, some trials suggest it is um, safe to do this to a certain um, extent, but it um, depends really on the pre-participation risk stratification. It comes back, back to this. I can, I've seen, we see, all see patients where we can be very clear, there is no exercise for you or just mild exercise. When we have the data that during exercise, we've to get non-sustained, sustained arrhythmias. Also very important, which I didn't talk about, what are the risk factors in patients fibrosis, which is not part of the risk model at the moment, but we look at fibrosis on the MI scan. Um, is certainly a risk factor for an arrhythmic substrate. So again, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I feel can be better classified than athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because all the risk factors, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, they are not there in athletes. So the main substrate for sudden cardiac arrest is arrhythmias. And that's why, as you alluded to, we also have a different approach in arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy, because the arrhythmia risk and the arrhythmia phenotype is most often there before we have a, a morphological heart failure phenotype. Um, so, yeah, and I know that. Go on. No, sorry, C carry on. I, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, no, not at all. Not at all. And and uh, I, I would just say these studies looking at high intensity exercise, but also looking at the uh, exercise load, or the volume of training and exercise are needed because if we really um, um, allow patients, athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to compete, you know, alluding to the previous talk, should they compete in high intensity anaerobic sports, stop and go? Should they do um, sports where they do a lot of endurance and have a higher training load? We will need to differentiate then as well. So I, I would even, or I can clearly say that eligibility in Hokum is sports specific. Okay. In, in terms of um, athletes that have been through your screening programs, um, who have very big hearts, um, um, who have, um, you know, concentric remodeling, good, thick, chunky chambers, uh, and it's deemed physiological adaptation throughout their career, but they're retired now. What's the prognosis for those big hearts as they go into, go into middle, they've retired from their career and they're now into the, late, the later stages of life? Yeah, well, this, this actually, um, um, alludes to a whole different topic, which is the athlete after retirement. And we have also probably um, ethical um, um, duties 
um, maybe even to follow these athletes up, which does not happen. What we know, if it is athletic remodeling, we all know this, this will um, regress. And, and if it is cardiomyopathy, it will not. However, I do not advocate detraining as a, as a diagnostic tool for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've got more elegant um, tools there, for example, MRI and also exercise imaging. So a phenotype of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, however, can be missed during screening as well during the athletic career because it's undulating. It's not always linearly progressive. There might be years of no progression in the disease, but then it might um, actually get worse. So yes, if I screen an athlete at 30 years old and there's remodeling, I can nowadays relatively safely with all tools say that is no hypertrophic cardiomyopathy within the limits of our screening tools. But I cannot predict um, what happens in 10, 20 years time, which leads you on to what you do with genotype positive and phenotype negative um, athletes at the moment. We would follow them up and we would let them play. Because again, as I say, genetics is not tight enough to predict how, how severe and when the disease appears. No, very good. Um, I just want to go back to the, the you've identified somebody that um, the, the, they're expressing an early mild phenotype, ECG may be abnormal, echo may be mildly abnormal, but there's no fibrosis, CPET is good, etc. How much weight do you put behind the, the, the family history and the personal symptoms? Um, and this is just anecdotal, this is just from, from our experience here, is that most of the athletes aren't honest in terms of their family history uh, and certainly say they are asymptomatic and you scratch the surface a little bit more after a number of years and you look back and actually there is a strong family history uh, and uh, they haven't been entirely truthful. But that's important in the early discussion about allowing these individuals to continue to compete. So uh, how, do you, how do you sort of get away with that, especially for the international athletes? It's a difficult one, I know. Difficult, difficult question. And as you say, particular family history and previous dizziness, syncope are risk factors for sudden cardiac death. I think we, we, we got ourselves as medical professionals into this situation as being perceived as sports cardiologists. This is the person who says yes or no. And if you've got any cardiac problem, you will not compete again. And I think sports cardiologists have has evolved, uh, sports cardiology has evolved. We create an environment where we assess the athletes and then make decisions together, but also do the follow-up and risk stratify the athletes. But I think this is, needs to be communicated and this cannot always be done via a questionnaire. Although the questionnaire, health questionnaire that most screening um, programs um, have in their um, SOPs is very important. You're absolutely right. Um, it is very, very, um, difficult to get the full story. For this, you need consultation, you need um, um, longer consultations with the athletes. You know? And also, I think more education on a grander level to see that what we are trying to do is not um, only preventing sudden cardiac death, but really profiling. That's why I like to call it not only screening, but also profiling and monitoring to accompany the athletes athlete, even if he's got a cardiac disease through his career, and there's some examples in football and so on where this has happened, and it has been safe and rewarding for the athletes and for the team involved. No, I think you're right. It's about reframing the situation to say that we want these athletes to compete. We want to try and make sure they can do it in a, in a safe, safest way as possible. Absolutely. Um, Great, Guido, thank you so much for, for that wonderful talk, uh, and thank you Sanjay and, and Kim previously. I'll hand over to you now uh, and you'll introduce Marta. Excellent. So thanks very much, Matt. So uh, we have uh, one fantastic talk left and I know this because I know Marta, Professor Marta Sitges very well. She is the director of the um, Cardiovascular Institute at the Hospital Clinique in Barcelona and has uh, spent um, Many, many hours researching and publishing fantastic papers on very, very different topics within cardiology. And she's also a practically very experienced uh, sport cardiologist. And we can discuss if she is indeed working at the best club in the world or not, but certainly um, um, a very good club, uh, FTB, where Marta leads the sports cardiology program. 
And she is talking now about the um, master athlete, and we just alluded to it into the dis in the discussion now. This is a group of athletes we must not forget. Um, when the athlete retires, might not train as much, lifestyle changes will be there as well. And I think we need to focus more on the uh, follow-up and monitoring of these athletes. Marta, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here in this nice meeting. It's a pity that we cannot be there, but we are on our souls and hearts. So uh, it's my pleasure to share with you the following, uh, the upcoming 20 minutes talking on the veteran athlete. So we are supporting the veteran athlete with suspected heart disease. So first of all, I would like to, to ask the question, what do we consider a veteran athlete? So we have several types of veteran athlete and we have to take that into consideration. So it's not the same to, uh, to evaluate for example, a uh, guy such as Tommy Hughes, who, was a mar who is a marathon runner, has been a marathon runner for years, and he's one of the champions in that veteran league. It's completely different to evaluate another guy, Pedro Perez, who is a 57-year-old male who has been uh, drinking a little bit, who has been hypertensive, and now she has, he has decided to change his life and he has started biking. And it's not the same to consider a guy like Jogon Grief, who was, as you know, a previous football player, previous uh, coach at Football Club Barcelona, and he had myocardial infarction because he was also a smoker. So we have to consider all these types of potential veteran athletes that we might be facing and that we should consider. So the initial approach might change a lot depending on which type of veteran, veteran athlete we, we, we have in front of us. And also the different approach will be if the guy has a previous non-heart disease as when we evaluated, uh, for example, Johan Grief after his myocardial infarction or if the uh, athlete has symptoms or not. The scope of this talk is not talking about uh, athletes with known previous heart disease. So this is very well covered and addressed in the current guidelines that were published last year. And I'm not going to speak on those athletes with previously known heart disease. I'm going to talk mainly on those athletes that we, at, uh, at the time we are seeing them, we don't know if they have heart disease. They might have symptoms. Uh, these symptoms can be shortened of breath, fatigue, chest pain. Of course, we will have to rule out in those cases coronary artery disease because this is an, not an elderly but an older population. So in these patients, as we will see later, coronary artery disease is the most prevalent disease. But symptoms can be those of palpitations and syncope. But we always have to keep our eyes very open because dyspnea or all these symptoms are not always due to coronary artery disease. And let me share a very quick case with you that we had with a veteran athlete. This is a 60 year old, year old male amateur endurance athlete who has been performing marathons for years. He has no medical reports, no personal fam or family history of sudden cardiac death. And he comes to our consultation for worsening exertional dyspnea for the previous three weeks. He didn't refer to pain, no syncope, no palpitation. Physical exam was fine and there was sinus rhythm with incomplete right uh, BBB on the ECG. And what called our, our attention was his right ventricle on the echocardiogram. As you can see, he had a very dilated or a dilated right ventricle with a very uh, normal left ventricle, which was almost shrink by the right ventricle with a very flattened uh, interventricular septum and uh, with, a, with tricuspid regurgitation, we could estimate a pulmonary artery pressure around 70 millimeters of mercury. So we suspected this athlete had a pulmonary uh, embolism that was confirmed with a cardiac CT and also 
deep pulmonary uh, deep sorry uh, venous thrombo uh, thrombosis was was confirmed after left popliteal vein. Indeed, the the athlete was complaining of his ankle of, of his leg. Oh, I think one of my muscle fibers has been broken. This was the typical complaint. So nobody thought of venous thrombosis. But in the veteran athlete, we have to think also on that. And even we reported that case, uh, highlighting that this even running and the repeated stress on the on the leg veins can be a risk factor for this uh, fact. So that's another thing to think uh, when we are evaluating these veteran athletes, these master athletes. The other issue is atrial fibrillation in athletes. As you know, there is compelling evidence currently that athletes have an increased risk for developing for a higher incidence of or prevalence of uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation. And this is related to the intensity of the physical training. As you know, this is very well demonstrated. So that's something else that we have to think when we think, when we evaluate athletes uh, complaining with dyspnea or palpitations. So atrial fibrillation is a little bit more common in this population and treatments work perfectly as well as we have shown and several authors have shown as in other patients with low natural fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation has to be treated as we do in other patients, not being athletes, but we have to keep in mind that atrial fibrillation might be more frequent in athletes and therefore is something that we have to suspect, particularly in endurance athletes that complain with dyspnea or, or palpitations. Syncope has all, is always another is other, another symptom that can occur in master athletes, and there are several etiologies uh, for syncope in 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 athletes in in master athlete, in veteran athletes. Of course, conduction abnormalities are much more frequent than in young individuals. Uh, ventricular tachycardia, of course, uh, even with in in athletes that we they don't have. Uh, known previous heart disease, and here it's very important the role, the diagnostic role of cardiac magnetic resonance. Heart valve disease, of course, starts to appear in master athletes, particularly aortic stenosis and degenerative mitral regurgitation. And also, of course, some of these athlete, athletes may develop some form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy related to heart hypertensive car, uh, heart disease, but also even uh, late onset hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And it's important to keep this in mind, this diagnosis, also to keep in mind that these are athletes and they want to live uh, practicing uh, activ physical activity. So all these potential diagnoses have also implications for potential therapies. It's important if we are evaluating a master athlete in terms of selecting the type of pacemaker, if it has to be indicated a pacemaker. So it's not the same for a, a, a person who is physically active than for a person 80 years old that maybe is not so physically active. It's also important in terms for uh, in the implications for treating uh, valve disease and also for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Particularly for heart valve disease, it's important in terms of choosing the right time, maybe earlier in an active, in a physical active person, even if they are asymptomatic. That's something to debate, but that's something that we really consider when we are evaluating a master athlete. And also for choosing the type uh, in the case that repair is not possible, repair should be always uh, be the, 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 the first choice. But if repair is not possible, it's also important for the implications of choosing the type of prosthesis. Okay, so it's not only the age, of course, but also in these master athletes, their physical activity and their willingness to continue practice the sport. So things to consider when we are evaluating these master athletes. Second part, so what uh, about the athlete that has no symptoms? Do we need to screen? So why should we screen them? So this is the answer. So this is the incident. <laughs> Sorry, this is the incidence of a sport related sudden cardiac death in this report by uh, the French group by, by Eloy Marie John. So, as you can see, uh, in the master athletes, so those above, above 50, uh, 35 years old and, and also those above 50, they have the higher incidence of sudden cardiac death, as you know, 
uh, and this occurs. So these are the, the, the really, the, the ones really that we need to prevent, of course, all of them, also the youngest, but this is something that happens also in master athletes, and it happens mainly to coronary artery disease. So that's the main cause, as you all know. So mainly what we want to prevent and what we want to screen is mainly for this coronary, uh, non-acute uh, coronary artery disease, the chronic one, which is the one that we can uh, diagnose more and we can predict more with current available uh, techniques. Other remarks that we have to take into account into the veteran athlete is that this, many of these people, it depends a little bit as I was showing my first slide, it depends a little bit on the type of veteran athlete, but many of them have a transformation. They have been uh, many years of their life training in competition sometimes. And when they become a veteran, they, they, they keep on doing a, sp uh, a sport practice, uh, practicing a sport, sorry, but sometimes they acquire some habits, okay? So overweight is quite frequent uh, in some of them, high blood pressures. Unfortunately, smoking is still uh, prevalent as well as alcohol intake, and some of them also may become diabetic. So this is something that we uh, have to face, and this, at, uh, in the end, many of them are behaving like real patients, not really athletes, but uh, patients that like to practice a sport. We have uh, tables for uh, stratify the risk. We know that these tables are, are recommended by the current guidelines and we can, depending on the presence of the risk, these risk factors, we can, and also the place they live, we can stratify these athletes into different risk, depending on, on the presence of these risk factors. But as I have said, many, many veterans athletes are on the, on the red areas because they have a little bit of over, overweight, they have hypertension. Some of them still smoke or they start to smoke when they retire from competition. And some of them start to uh, increase their alcohol intake when they retire from competition. So most of them, I would say they are like in the yellow red areas. So how should we screen these veteran athletes? Of course, ECG is a mandatory tool in these patients also, looking for conduction disturbances, looking for some signs of ischemia, uh, and this should be uh, a real must in these athletes. What about the stress test? A stress test can provide, as you know, very in useful information about ischemia, but also very useful information on arrhythmia, blood pressure response, and of course, on the functional capacity, particularly for those veteran athletes that start to increase uh, the, their load, their training load, or st start training. So I think in this in these uh, veteran athletes, it's also important to start to look at their function at their consumption, oxygen consumption. But for this particular subset of, pa of patients or of athletes uh, that are athletes, we really need to adequate the protocol. So we cannot use Bruce protocol. We really need to change our stress protocols in our treadmills or bikes and provide a real maximal effort a stress test to have adequate conclusions. What's the problem with the stress test to detect coronary and artery disease in the master athlete? And that's the reason that, as we will see in the guidelines, the level of evidence is not that uh, clear. The problem as shown in this study uh, uh, with more than 1,000 ath master athletes uh, is the, f the, the number of false positive exercise test results. So the, 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 cure, the diagnostic accuracy of a stress test is well known in patients with a high pretest of coronary artery disease and with different uh, pretest probabilities, but in the particular a population of athletes, the biggest problem is its high false positive uh, results. Also, it has been uh, proposed to scan them or to, to screen them with echocardiography. I think echocardiography is a fantastic tool to provide information on valvular heart disease, which is important in this population uh, and much more important as they become uh, older. 
Also, it's important in terms to detect left ventricular hypertrophy related to hypertensive cardiomyopathy and also to excessive cardiac remodeling in these athletes. Uh, also, in some of them to detect abnormal wall motions related to ischemic, to potential ischemic heart disease. And as I have said, to, to detect consequences of training as atrial dilatation and dysfunction as a previous marker of potential development of atrial fibrillation and also uh, dilatation of the ascending aorta. What about cardiac CT? Cardiac CT has been proposed as the magic uh, diagnostic tool to detect coronary artery disease in this subset of, 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 of the population in athletes. And uh, I will spend a little bit more time on, on, on some studies on, on, the, on the role of cardiac CT. This is the results of a study performed in athletes, mean age was 50, uh, in veteran athletes, mean age was 55 year olds, all of them had low risk uh, according to the uh, ESC score. 94% of them had a score less than four, and all of them had a negative stress test. And all of them underwent uh, calcium scoring and angiocity, and you can see here the results. So up to almost 50% of them had a calcium score above 100, about, uh, had calcium in the coronaries, and, and some of them above 100. Uh, units and also uh, around almost 60% of them had some degree of coronary stenosis, most of them non significant, but they had coronary disease. So, indeed, uh, the, the, there was a low sensitivity to detect subclinical coronary artery disease with the stress test. This is the confirmation, as we have said before, and it's uh, a finding that initially surprises us because practicing a sport is kind of, okay, this is the best tool to prevent this. So a little bit more deeply, some studies further analyze these findings. So confirming that athletes had indeed more uh, plaques as compared to male controls, but indeed the composition was completely different. So these athletes had a composition with more calcium, Okay, and this was also related to uh, the, uh, the amount of training. So the more trained the athletes were, the more calcify, uh, uh, the more calcify the plaque were. So indeed, we know that this profile of this type of plaques, more calcify, less mixture, mixed uh, components, they have a better profile uh, in terms of outcomes. Okay, we know these plaques are more stable, and they seem to to break and, and start, uh, get less unstable stability and induce less cor acute coronary syndromes. And this was indeed confirmed in further studies, also performing asymptomatic subjects uh, with, uh, with, with calcium score. And here what the, the, the authors analyzed was the impact of exercising on the prognosis of these patients. So among all these subjects with these high score, with these higher scores, particularly above 400 Agatston units, uh, the practice of in moderate and extensive exercise indeed was related to a very good prognosis of these patients. So it seems that exercise kind of um, uh, changed the prognosis of these patients despite having high uh, calcium uh, score scores in their coronary uh, in their coronary CTs. So to summarize the role of cardiac CT, uh, let's say that coronary artery calcium is, is frequent in athletes. The sproit, the prognosis is different because it's not so bad as in not athletes, unlike exercise counterparts for this bad prognosis of, of high calcium in the coronary uh, arteries. But additionally, the problem of just screening with CT, uh, with cardiac CT, is that anatomic uh, coronary imaging alone does not provide information on ischemia. So we will further need functional imaging on these athletes. So uh, with this setting or with this scenario of these different utilities of these two diagnostic tools, what do the guidelines say? The guidelines mainly highlight the problem of the very high number of false positive tests of exercise testing in these adults that are asymptomatic. And indeed, initially, they don't recommend this. But 
Uh, afterwards, what they recommend first is the risk with this uh, risk stratification tables, despite they recognize that the level of evidence is low. It's important always, as I have said at the beginning, to consider which type of athlete and particularly which is the type of exercise and the intensity of the exercise program the, the, the athlete performs. And then, uh, then they recommend this, not only the clinical evaluation, but also include exercise maximal stress tests. And of course, individualizing depending on the individuals. In the end, what they recommend is according to the, to the risk. As I have said, most of the veterans have high cardiovascular risk because some are hypertensive, some have, uh, have a little bit of overweight. So in this, they recommend to do a maximal exercise test. And uh, depending on, on the risk and the type of exercise at some coronary uh, calcium score or even some echocardiography, or of course, if the patient has high risk features, symptoms, or a positive uh, stress test, they should undergo coronary angiography. What is our approach here in, in Barcelona, in the Football Club Barcelona, with our veterans, and also in, in Catalonia, in our uh, uh, Catalan government uh, sports program. So what we recommend and uh, uh, what we do is uh, for athletes that are in competition and in, in federated uh, uh, clubs, what we recommend is that if they are 35 years, uh, older than 35 years old, uh, we, we recommend what we call uh, to combine an advanced cardiovascular uh, assessment combined with a basic one. And here you have this info, which is a basic includes a basic evaluation includes ECG, a physical exam, an amnesis performed by a sports physician or a sports cardiologist, which is uh, used to evaluate athletes and to evaluate uh, athlete, uh, ECGs from athletes and combine uh, annually with the advanced uh, cardiological evaluation, which is uh, where we add also a stress test, conventional stress test, and also echocardiography. Okay, so depending on the on the findings, we modify this this algorithm. But what we do is every year we see the veterans with an ECG, with a physical examination, and an amnesis. And every two years we combine it with a stress test and echocardiography. This is very similar to the approach proposed by these authors that look for the efficacy of a screening in master athletes. They evaluated almost 800 uh, master athletes and they found that 11% of them had cardiovascular disease, according to this uh, algorithm. So indeed, this confirms what we know that if you look for it, you find disease, cardiac disease in these patients. Is it cost efficacy, uh, effic uh, effic uh, efficacy? Uh, regarding this? Uh, we have here the comparison of different population. Let's just stick to the older ones. So of course, the older the athletes uh, uh, become, the most effective the screening is because the, the prevalence of the disease is higher. So the number of patients or athletes to screen uh, become, becomes lower. And of course, this becomes more and more cost efficient particularly for the uh, affected uh, athlete or the disease, uh, the, the sick athlete is particularly of importance. So to summarize before concluding, uh, uh, we can say that the, as we all know, the main cause of problems in master athletes is coronary artery disease. How to screen this is still not solved. But we have to acknowledge that uh, according to the current guidelines, risk assessment with a score has low level of evidence and still that's on a stress test for a screening is poor. And we know the level of evidence and the recommendation is uncertain. On the one hand, we know we have a lot of false positives, but on the other hand, in the end, we, we indicate it in most of our veteran athletes. Uh, regarding calcium scores, seems to 
be helpful, uh, but not so much for a screening because many athletes have it and definitely it's not a test to do it isolated, probably useful combined with a functional assessment with a stress test. I would say ECHO is useful for, for detecting valve disease and also to evaluate the, imp the impact of training to see if there is excessive remodeling, particularly focus on the aorta and uh, left atrium dilatation of these patients, left atrium and right atrium, both can induce atrial fibrillation. So to conclude, I would say that the current screening for coronary artery disease is based in most places, uh, on most sites on symptoms and performing echo and a maximal exercise test. This seems according to some initial experience to be effective and cost effective, sorry. However, we have to admit that this approach does not identify individuals with mild to moderate atherosclerotic the lorotic plaques that can break and that can induce coronary acute syndromes. And this is the area that we really need to further uh, perform research. And we really need to, 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 to see what's the, the, the best optimal screening for this issue and to really identify individuals at higher risk. It's important in terms of athletes because they are becoming older and older. We know that, but also for the general population, of course. So I would like to finish. Thank you for your attention. And, it's, and if you have questions, I will be glad to answer them on my email. Thank you very much for your attention. Marta, thank you very much for this excellent summary of the very challenging and often contradictory data um, in this area. So, however, what your data shows and what, you, well, what you've shown is clearly that, um, you know, there's a little scratch on the image of the invincible and healthy Olympic athlete forevermore. So, there is a high, there is a high risk of cardiac disease in, in veteran athletes. Um, what would you recommend um, athletes who are about to finish their competitive career um, in terms of how much exercise to do. Sure, they just continue to stay as healthy as they are. Sure, they stop exercise because you show, show clearly there's a risk factor for atrial fibrillation if you do a lot of endurance athletes. Or should you do this boring recommendations of 20 minutes, three times a week running? What would you say? What is the healthiest for the heart? You're still muted, Marta. Sorry. Thank you very much, Guido, and Matt, for the invitation for the course. And thank you very much for the nice introduction, Guido. Uh, I think we still have uh, many, many controversial issues in the field of master athletes. You said we know that sports uh, increases the incidence of heart disease. I would like to, to soften. I, I think exercise is a great tool to prevent uh, heart disease. What we have shown and others, and what it has been shown, is that they might have more plaques in the coronary arteries and definitely they have more atrial fibrillation, particularly if they do endurance athletes. However, I would not take that to prevent them from continuing their sport practice. I always encourage them to keep on training and to do exercise as they want, because still we need a lot to do to really prevent and or ident early identify those at higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation, for example. On the other hand, for coronary plaques, we know that exercise contra, uh, counterparts for the bad effects of coronary calcium. So in these people, I think, uh, doing exercise is also good. So, in our experience, at least in FCV, where we, uh, in Football Club Barcelona, sorry, where we have been more in touch with these veteran athletes, uh, our impression, it's, it's an impression, I don't have numbers, sorry, but our impression is that a lot of these people, once they finish competition, uh, they become, they change their lifestyle. And we think that's a pity because they become obese or they have an overweight, they become, they start to smoke and then they have the usual problems of citizens, no? <laughs> so then they have hypertensive heart disease and so on. So we really encourage them to, to keep on doing their exercise. 
we know the perfect formula. We don't have it, of course, and I don't believe there is one single perfect formula because we are all different. So I think one individual may have a very good response to a very high intensity exercise and another doing the same might have a very different response. So my, my advice and my recommendation is always, always to keep on exercising, do what you like and what you feel good, but watch your heart. So do your medical screening, do your regular checkups. We know they have limited value. I know, but that's better than nothing. So that's our recommendation. Okay. And how we do that? We do mainly by clinical interrogation, of course, and as I have said, echocardiography and a stress test. For the time being, I think, and of course, control of the lipids and glucose and, and so on. No? But I think for the time being, these are the best tools that we have for the time being. Maybe in the future we are uh, better with having more databases and more intelligent, artificial intelligence to predict really which are the ones that are going to be having problems. That's okay. our recommendations. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I want to go a bit more into it because there are many questions regarding atrial fibrillation. And um, what you do with the with the master athlete with with really low atrial fibrillation without any other risk factors? Do you restrict them? Do you restrict them temporary for exercise? What what? How do you but, engage that, with the athlete and plan? That that's another challenge. <laughs> What we have, uh, I mean, first of all, we treat them as if they were not athletes. We are quite proactive in indicating ablation to them. Our, uh, the group of USMON and, and, and our group here in clinic has shown that the outcomes with ablation are similar to the rest of the population. But of course, we also know that if you don't modify the risk factor, the outcomes are not going to be as good, okay? So it's very difficult to, 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 to tell somebody who loves running to say, stop running, no? So what we are trying to do is to convince that they change a little bit the way they train. So uh, reduce a little bit the intensity, try to avoid competition because in the end, preparing for competition, it's a lot of training. And we are also trying to uh, I recommend them that they combine disciplines. For example, swimming and running instead of only running. Okay, but again, that's something that we have started to do, and we don't have uh, prospective data if that really has a beneficial. It's our feeling that the change in the, the way they train uh, may have an impact. But definitely, of course, we have some patients that we have have to discourage them from training, particularly. And bikers and runners. Yeah. Okay. And that of them, some of yeah. them we have stopped them. Okay. Thank you. Another big topic is because you you, you elegantly described the different pathology in master athletes. Of course, there are different screening and, and monitoring um, pathways. So, and the big question is, um, do we really come in with our old weaponry? And for example, should we do um, CT calcium scoring in asymptomatic veteran athletes or not? Uh, my, 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 my opinion is that no, at the time being no, because as I said before, I mean, we will, have, we will find uh, with high probability plaques, uh, so you will need a functional test additionally, uh, and then you have the patient, I mean, living with that. So this is a still a matter of controversy, not only in athletes, but in the whole population. So should we be actively screening for calcium in the coronary arteries and treating with aspirin and astatins the whole population or not? It seems that athletes, athletes indeed are the group with less risk because, because of their exercise, the benefits of the exercise counterpart for the risk of having plaques in the coronary arteries. So I think that the first question has to be answered in the non-athletic population. And still there's a lot of controversy on that, okay? Because of course, there's a lot of derivation of maybe uh, then there's a lot of angioplasties derived from there and we still need a little bit more of evidence. It seems now that the balance is more pro treating these people and screening actively, but I think in athletes uh, will be the second group that will. The, the first question we have is in the whole population. People not performing athlete, uh, sports that are the ones who are really at high risk with plaques and not performing sports. 
Excellent, Mada. This is a fantastic final message because yes, we are talking here and focus on a, on a on a very subpopulation of uh, in terms of cardiovascular risk. But we mustn't forget that exercise is good for your heart, and out there, many people who do not do enough exercise, and they are at much higher risk. Absolutely. Good, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much uh, to Marta for this excellent talk again. I've got the uh, pleasure to conclude um, the cardiology session. Unless Matt shakes his head and says no, which he doesn't. Fantastic. So um, I would like first to thank all the speakers, um, Craig, uh, Sanjay, um, Kim, and, and, and Marta as well. All, all, all these colleagues of ours are at the top of their game, and um, you could see this today and have also shown you that sports cardiology is moving and is moving fast. And now we have enough data because of the work of particularly these people who talk today to really answer detailed questions. So there was an exciting decade ahead. And I'm glad we could share this with all of you. Thanks very much to all the participants to, to staying with us to the end. I hope it was a day worthwhile. And I would like to thank um, Professor Matt Wilson for organizing and uh, this conference and sharing it, and also our director of ICH, Faris Haddad, um, for guiding this and steering this ship into, I think, the right direction. And if I am allowed to say um, a comment that came to me over the day, um, why I uh, think it was so 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 nice to combine these respiratory and the cardiac um, 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 talks. Because often we see athletes with either shortness of breath or with some kind of chest pain, some kind of palpitations. And it's fantastic to um, have this interfaculty uh, discourse with our respiratory colleagues. And I hope they see it the same way um, to really, really assess not the heart or not the lungs of the athlete, but to assess the athletes and get to the bottom of it. And most importantly, help the athlete to get back RTP to competition level. And, um, I need to make a compliment to ICH because this is a place where this is has been happening and is happening and where we have the opportunity to do this. So thanks also to the IT guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed your day. I hope you learned a lot. Um, thanks to everyone. It's a pleasure seeing you all right online. And hopefully in the future years, we can do this in person in some nice venue somewhere. Nice evening to everyone. Take care. All the best.